Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by, by Plants. Plants. Today we bring to you episode 443, The Fiber Paradox and Histamine Foods with Dr. Will Balsowitz. In this episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talk with Dr. B all about microbiome, fermented foods, the fiber paradox, and histamine. It's always fun talking with Dr. B because he is a wealth of information. One might even say that his episode is full of sh- but we don't want to give you the wrong impression. We talked about how dog kisses and human kisses can help our microbiome. We got into new research on fermented foods. So if you've heard past episodes, you're going to want to listen to this. And we see where kombucha is on his list of fermented foods and how good he thinks they are for you. And finally, we got to the topic as planned of histamine. And you're going to want to listen to this closely and take notes as there are some really, really great tips and information in here and find out what is the superfood to help with your histamine reactions. Dr. B is an award-winning gastroenterologist, internationally recognized gut expert, and the New York Times best-selling author of Fiber Fueled and the Fiber Fueled Cookbook. He sits on the scientific advisory board of ZOE, has authored more than 20 articles published in peer-reviewed scientific journals, has given more than 40 presentations at national meetings presented to Congress and the USDA, and has taught over 10,000 students how to heal and optimize their gut health. This is Dr. B's third time on the show. So much great information, and it's always a pleasure to talk to him. Enjoy this episode. You're going to love it. Share it out. And congratulations, Dr. B, on the addition to your new family. You've told us that you're bored of what you're cooking. You've told us that you're not eating out as much and you want to be a little bit more entertained with what's on our plate. So we showed up and we made the Plant-Based Comfort Foods Cookbook. It is an e-cookbook that is above and beyond what we've done before. The pictures are gorgeous. The recipes are easy, but they're going to look restaurant quality. We are super excited for this book and we can't wait for you to get your utensils on it. Check out the link in the show notes or check it out at planttrainers.com slash shop. And now for a moment of gratitude. I am so grateful for the ability to travel again. I got on an airplane. I went to Vegas. I had fun. I was at a a health conference, but had some fun as well at Lady Gaga. It's just so wonderful to be back into life again. I've been coaching volleyball all year, working with five different teams. And my last season just ended. And just so grateful to work with so many great athletes and have such a positive experience and impact. Dr. B, welcome back to the Plant Trainers Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm uh, very happy to be here. It's been it's nice to see you guys. It's you guys have been a part of my journey, which is cool. I mean, I, I know you know that, but the listeners at home may not know that. That uh, we first connected probably what 2018 or 19, 2018. Yeah, yeah. makes yeah. sense. So you know, I mean, I think <laughs> it's just kind of crazy to think about how much my life has changed in this short period of time. The last time our second episode together was 2020. That was my book, Fiber Fueled. And that was a New York Times bestseller. And two years later, it sold 200,000 copies. It's been really wow. a wild ride. Congrats. So, That's awesome. And I'm very, I'm very um, grateful to be here with you guys today to, you know, kind of pick back up and talk about some new stuff. And I just want to comment before we go in that you have a beautiful puppy. Oh, thank, thank you. you. We were talking about how this puppy who's licking your face uh, voraciously is actually really good for the microbiome. She is. She is. She. So yeah, that that was the question that I was asking you. And and just to go back, we're going to link in the show notes. You were on episode 219 of the Plant Trainers podcast, and then you were on episode 356, which was when Fiber Fuel came out. And now with I think, your, your... I think this one's going to be 443. 443? Wow. On the day, like on the day of your book coming back out. <laughs> <laughs> this is rich like roll level with the number of episodes that you guys have been doing. It's very impressive. Well, because it's the dedication, you have to stick with it. That's the issue. Yeah. And most people don't. Yeah, you do have to stick with it. And and it's amazing because you get so you get so much. I mean, it can be very lonely on one side of the microphone, but then you get the emails, you get the people interacting on the Instagram, you get the people, you know, 
buying your book and putting pictures of it in their Instagram stories and those kind of things. So it is, it's absolutely amazing. And now when I take new potential client phone calls or just, you know, free consults that I give to some of our listeners, we hop on and they go, so how's the puppy? And I'm like, that's so weird. I don't know you at all, but you know exactly what's going on in our life. And yeah, puppies change your life, but they also change your microbiome, right? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting because they, they have studies going back a very long time where they showed that if you have pets at home, then you are less likely to have allergic diseases mm. like seasonal allergies or asthma. And um, so now we know that actually our environment in like our, our environment, our world that we are surrounded by, not just our food can change and modify our gut microbiome. And they, they've shown that when, for example, humans kiss, so like, you know, your dog kisses you, shares a lot of love. <laughs> when, when humans like kiss, you saw earlier. <laughs> like I saw earlier. It's the that's the B the B clips. But um <laughs> anyway, when humans kiss, we actually share a hundred billion microbes, which is quite fascinating. And the theory is that maybe we're like expressing compatibility with one another because we all do it and we have that intrinsic desire to do that. But why? Why do we do that? And um, so now there's new research that just came out that that is that I discuss in my new book that I'm very excited to share with you guys because you said, oh, it's very lonely, you know, being on this side of the microphone. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, how is it possibly lonely when you're married to the plant based Vin Diesel? <laughs> <laughs> Every single time I'm here with you guys, you're together. And you've actually expressed, I remember our first podcast episode together that you said, you know, the key to a healthy relationship is you do a podcast with your spouse. Yeah. All right. So check this out. New research. This is really cool. So they discovered that pe that people who are in a relationship together and cohabitate, I mean, basically like people who are married, they actually share microbes. And what's interesting is that they share more microbes than they do with siblings. So like, for example, that means I share more microbes with my wife then I would share with my own brothers, even though my brothers share my genetic code and come from the same mom and come from the same place as me. Right. And when they analyze this, the naturally the people will say, okay, well, it must be the food, right? You're in the same house. So you're eating the same food. They actually controlled for that. And they still discovered that people who are in a relationship share more microbes. Now here's, here's my favorite part. This is why I couldn't, I couldn't wait to bring this up with you guys. Cause again, you're always together. They discovered that not all couples share microbes on the same level. Hmm. That they started to look into, well, what's the state of your relationship? Are you in a good place? Are you happy? Do you love one another? Or alternatively, do you feel actually like um, separated from one another where you're not really connected anymore? And they discovered that people who feel more connected share more microbes. Hmm. That's so cool. So that could be something that a therapist could put into their practice and get their microbiome tested first to know where they're actually at versus what, what they're saying and bring that in, into play. Oh, a hundred percent. And what, what's fascinating about this is that, so first of all, there's this, there's these studies that we don't talk about enough, right? Like myself, I'm, I am uh, personally guilty of fixating too much on nutrition when there are these studies that you're more likely to hear from someone like Dan Buettner from the blue zones talking about how, when we are socially connected, that's one of the keys to longevity. People live longer, healthier lives because they feel connected. And it starts to make sense because we are social creatures. If you want to torture a human being, you isolate them. And if you want to actually bring out the best in a human being, you love them and you support them. And you tell them how great they are. And you tell them that no matter what happens, you will support them. Because when a person feels that way, then they feel safe. And it actually, Shoshana gets to the brain-gut connection that you're alluding to, talking about like a therapist, for example. Because let me just kind of get nerdy for a moment here. Um, the brain-gut connection is the connection between our gut microbes and our brain function. And there's different ways in which both of them are talking to one another right now. And the, one of the ways that the brain talks to your gut is that it will release a hormone called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. And this CRH, which comes from the pituitary gland, will basically initiate a cascade of stress events, your stress response, that if you follow what's happening from that point down, you will actually discover that it's um, causing injury to your microbiome, 
causing dysbiosis. And this is part of the reason why during times of acute stress, most of us will actually manifest it in our gut, right? Bloating, gas, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea. But take a person who has chronic stress and it could be like serious trauma, but it could also be normal life stuff like COVID-19 or like an unhealthy relationship or uh, a job that you hate. And that, now that stress response is perpetually activated and it never lets up. And these are the people who, these are the people who they do everything right. They eat the fiber fueled way and they sleep and they exercise and they meditate and they're trying. They go to their sauna, like they're doing everything and they never get better because basically their gut is being held back by this thing in their life that's unsettled that's messing them up. And this is where I, I just felt compelled to bring that into the conversation because it's not just the relationship. It's actually the effect that the relationship has on how you feel about yourself. So you're being held, your gut's being held hostage by your stress levels or by your relationships. So if you quit the job or get a divorce or find love or move out or whatever it is, will you still have remnants of that and have to work really hard at overturning that? Or if you're already eating the fiber field way, will you eventually just kind of settle out? My experience has been that if you take people that fit, that fit this description, this, this picture that we're painting right now, and these people are not rare, there, there are many of them out there. And they, they're the person who bounces from doctor to doctor and is never better. And it's not their fault. The issue is that we have not actually addressed the root of their problem, which is not simply a diagnosis, right? It's not, oh, you have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. It's that the root of your problem is that you have this unsettled part of your life that's disturbing you. And it may be in the non-conscious mind. It may not be something that you're even conscious of. And these it's a very personal thing and it's very context driven because what some of the examples that you just rattled off in my mind, as you're going through them, I'm like, yeah, that one you can fix real quick. And that one, no, that's not going to get, that's not going to be easy. And, you know, for example, uh, I'll just share a quick story. I had a patient recently who she has ulcerative colitis. She's young, late twenties, single, would love to meet someone not able to date because she's pooping around the clock can't even sleep at night. She has to wake up to go. And I have tried everything for this person to get them better. I tried all my tricks, plant-based diet, you know, sleep, exercise, the right medications. She was not, she was not refusing them. She's not getting better. And then one day recently she comes in and I'm kind of like nervous to go in the room because it's honestly, you know, it, we're both frustrated and, but I walk in and she instantly looks better, like different. And she has this big smile on her face, which was a pleasant surprise. And I sit down and I say, what happened? And she says, I feel like I'm actually myself again. Uh, I feel like I'm not oh, having my life dominated by a disease. And I said, so what changed? And she says, you know, I never told you this, but I had this job that I hated going to work every single day. Like I really was stressed even just getting in the car. And my boss would demean me in front of my peers, like yell at me in front of everyone. And she's like, it was not easy for me to do, but I eventually decided that I needed to have the courage to leave. And so she left that job. She found a new one. They actually treat her with respect. And like... <laughs> she came in and her disease was in remission. Hmm. It was like, she did not have all sort of colitis anymore. Right. Hmm. That's, that's incredible. That's how powerful this can be. But on the flip side, like if you get a divorce, this is where, I mean, we'd have to, you'd have to go through each one, but like if you go through a divorce and you have kids, I don't think the stress really goes away. It's complicated. So you, you need ways to manage all that. So stress yeah. management becomes super important in, in all aspects. Like it, there's all these uh, in integrative medicine or lifestyle medicine, they talk about all these different pillars and stress is always one of them. And it seems almost that stress could be one of the most important pillars for most people. And it's not just focused on nutrition alone, like you're saying. So 
I think people need to really take a, take a look and reflect on where they're at in their lives and their, with their relationships, with their nutrition, with everything. But the stress component is, is so much, so much more meaningful and important. And I think people overlook that. Yeah. And I think that we need to create avenues for these conversations to exist, right? Like in the sense that, um, it feels like it's a very stigmatized space where people are not comfortable talking about things that are negatively affecting them. Um, they're led to feel like it's a sign of weakness. Like how dare you feel that way? You're not strong. You can't just shake it off. You know, I mean that, and that's, that's not right. And the other thing is, I think that like casual flippant in interventions do nothing. Right. So like being like, we'll just meditate. Right. right. Come on. <laughs> like that's not going to work. We and need, you fall asleep we, when you meditate. So you're not really meditating. You're just taking a nap and, and all of that. But will that meditation, will those stress managements, will they just like reduce stress in the body, reduce inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, or will it actually change the gut microbiome as well? Well, I think when they're effective, when they actually are doing what the intended job is, because the, the, the process of doing it, but if what you're dealing with is beyond the intervention, mm -hmm. then you're not going to achieve the response that you're looking for because you're not actually changing the physiology of the body. Right. But, but when, when you intervene in a way that actually is making you feel more at ease, then yes, 100%, you actually will see improvement in the gut microbiome. In fact, the research will back that up. Hmm. Right. So when we got on before the microphone went on, we were talking about, you know, the dog and, and the licking and the, and the germ, the germs that come along with that. And then I got into the whole thing that, you know, especially here in Canada, different parts of the United States have been, have been a little bit similar where we haven't been able to do anything for two years, right? Like we're just kind of being let, let out of our cages for the first time now. So, you know, back in restaurants, not wearing, like there's no more mask mandate. So people are going out into public and they're getting sick right? Not sick, sick, but they're getting, they're getting their colds, they're getting those sniffles, they're getting all the little things that put them on alert, like, oh my God, do I have the virus kind of thing again? Um, so what can people do to strengthen their immune system if they haven't had the opportunity to be really dirty for the last two years? I mean, the, the ground's still kind of frozen, but should we go and like dig some ditches and roll around in our bathing suits in the, in the dirt? Like what, what can people do to strengthen their, their immunity and, and their, their microbiome that way? If you dig some ditches and roll around in your bathing suit, <laughs> please tag me in the Instagram photo that you share. I will. I will. <laughs> that is, that is quite uh, a visual. So <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know that there's necessarily, because at the end of the day, our microbiome is, in an amazing, beautiful, powerful way, a reflection of not one moment in time, but the total collection of us and who we are and our exposures and our environment. And so I don't, I don't want to go so far, Shoshana, to say that like you need an intervention where you do this to restart your microbiome. Instead, I think that the answer is just saying that it's um, time for us to, to create those patterns of health that are sort of most multifaceted. It's not just time spent outdoors, but the good news is like, I know where you guys live. I know how cold it is in March, but the good news is we're turning the corner and like May is going to be, you know, April, May, June, these are great months. And um, spring is here finally. So, um, so it's time to get back outdoors and it's time to, you know, get back into running outside and, coming to contact and having time with friends. And, you know, it's like, we're now integrating back into a more normal style of life compared to what we had, but then let's not forget the other stuff, right? Let's not forget to eat our plants and eat them in variety and in abundance. Actually, one thing that I should throw in, that's an update compared to two years ago, we have new research on fermentation. That's really exciting. So there's research out of Stanford university, professor Christopher Gardner. Have you guys had him on? The show? No, we haven't. We haven't, but we'll appreciate an email when this interview is done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. An email introduction. <laughs> he's awesome. He's awesome. And he's so he he this is like we're talking about one of the world's leading nutrition researchers, and he's plant-based. And so uh himself and then a couple of microbiome researchers, Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, they did a study where they basically had people eat fermented food for 10 weeks, and eating fermented food increased the diversity and health of their gut microbiome and reduced measures of inflammation. 
So like this is another thing that we can add to our repertoire is um, we're eating our plants, we're getting our fiber, we're eating wide varieties of plants. Everyone, you know, I, I would imagine if, you, if you've heard me on a podcast before, you've heard me talk about this, but now also let's add in the fermented foods and let's like tell someone that we love them and give them a hug and, you know, and spend some time outdoors and in nature and, you know. I actually wanted to ask you about fermented foods. First of all, in that study, like how much fermented food were they actually eating? Like how often so they, they, to see the benefit? Well, they were they were eating fermented food on a daily basis with the intervention. Prior to the intervention, the vast majority of people were not eating any fermented food. And to be to be um, fair, the the type of fermented food was very broad, so it did include fermented dairy. Um, they did not include sausages. <laughs> sausages were not considered <laughs> one of the fermented foods. So that's that's good. So, but what you saw is basically people who were not eating this way. And, you know, this is why this is a great opportunity because frankly, most people are not. And then over the course of 10 weeks, they ramped it up to, you know, somewhere on the range of five to six servings per day. Now, let me clarify what that is because that sounds ridiculous. Hmm. Whoa, five or six servings a day. That means I'm having like two full servings of fermented food at every meal. But what's Um, a serving? That's exactly the point. A serving is very small. So a serving is a very minimal amount. I mean, it could be two bites. So the key here is not necessarily do you get to five five or six servings. I'm not trying to stress people out and make them feel like, oh, gosh, I'm so woefully inept with my fermented food. Instead, I'm trying to inspire you to try something new and bring this this type of food into your diet. I personally, um, my favorite are fermented plants, of course, and like sauerkraut. The beauty of fermented plants over, say, fermented dairy, for example, is you get the microbes, but you also get the fiber and the polyphenols. And so this is like a triple hit of goodness for your gut microbiome. You are basically like sending down a huge wave of of excitement and and positive energy um, that can clearly, like now the evidence is saying, support a healthier gut microbiome. Let's take a little break so I can tell you about our plant-based comfort foods cookbook. This is comfort food, but I'm telling you it is healthy. Most of the recipes are gluten-free. All of the recipes except for one or two desserts can be made completely oil-free and have oil-free options right in them. The pictures are going to make you drool. This book is above and beyond what we have put out there before. We're talking about red sweet potato curry, garlic zucchini and tomato pasta, vegan tahini tray bake, tofu pasta, Pad thai, chocolate brownies. This is amazing. You're going to have enough food for weeks and weeks. And the great thing about this is that we've also included a meal plan and shopping guide to go with it. So if you just wanted to print out that page and go shopping, you'll know exactly what to make for the next two, three weeks. This is incredible. Please check it out in the show notes, or you can go to planttrainers.com shop and check out our plant-based comfort foods cookbook, Guys, this is going to blow you away. And now back to the show. So what I wanted to ask you about the fermented food was, is it normal or is it just me that throughout the winter when it's been cold, I've been eating a lot less fermented foods than I would normally do in the summer. And I'm wondering if that's just me losing touch with fermented food or it's part of the seasonal cycle and kind of normal for people to eat more fermented food in the warmer weather. What kind of fermented food do you like? Curious. So I'll buy sauerkraut. And the thing with me and sauerkraut is I'll eat it for a couple of days, maybe not consecutively, but if it, even though it's fermented, when it sits for too long, it makes me think that it's not good anymore. And then I just look at the jar forever. So that's a question that we can ask (laughs) you. Like if, if I'm buying, you know, an organic sauerkraut that I haven't made on my own and I've opened the jar two, three times to eat it on my own, how long will it last for before it's, over fermented and and moldy that's a so i'll i'll make we'll we'll have some miso we'll do some sauerkraut yeah but like Um, kimchi like haven't had that all winter kind of thing sauerkraut it's been once in a while kimchi is also something that we tend to eat in restaurants and buy at markets of which we've been to zero in the last two years too first of all it, it depends on how you choose to consume your fermented food Right. So if you have specific foods that you like to add sauerkraut to, then like like if it's like a plant based hot dog, for example, you know, then of course it's a summertime food for you. Right. But then 
like how about a little bit of sauerkraut with your soup, right? Just like kind of making a little iceberg that you pop it in your soup or your stew or your chili. Or a Buddha bowl. Or a Buddha bowl. Like there's other, there's other, it's, I think that's where it's like looking to find creative ways to introduce this to what is your dietary pattern during that season. Because, you know, like I would imagine chili is something that you're going to make in the wintertime, but you're probably not going to make when it's super hot in the summertime. Right. For sure. So how do we know it's safe? So um, first of all, when it comes, if you're doing home fermentation, then there are, you know, basic, basic steps that you have to follow to ensure food safety. And you, you want to take those steps very seriously and not be casual about it. I think that's part of what the responsibility is if you're going to choose to make your own fermented food. But regardless of whether you made it yourself or whether you bought it and it's um, got live active cultures and you bought it at a store, typically most fermented foods, it's hard to paint with broad strokes, but most fermented foods would be good for um, six months in the refrigerator. And we have to use our senses with any food, right? Not just fermented foods, any food. If the bread is moldy, you're not going to bite into it, right. right? If you see mold on the ferment, on, on the ferment, it would be there. It would have a different texture and color. And then you would know that this is probably time for me to get rid of this. That happened to the miso that I bought after... I'd say a couple of weeks of opening it, which I found really odd because miso is something that should be able to stay very long. And I just wondered if maybe my refrigerator was too, like we got a new, maybe the refrigerator was too cold and maybe it froze and then defrosted or I don't know. But if if it looks, if it smells slightly off or looks slightly, slightly off, I chuck it. It's not worth it. Um, I hate wasting, but I don't like gastro either. So what are, what are some other examples of, of good fermented food for people to, to try out? I think tempeh is amazing. It took me a while to get used to it. It's got sort of a nutty uh, flavor that um, is actually part of the, the result. It's, it's the result of the fermentation process. But like when you cook tempeh with other stuff, oh my gosh, it's so good. Mm. Put it in so, your chili so that it again, stays moist. Again, we haven't had tempeh like in that. a while. Yeah, we haven't had tempeh yeah. in a while too. We've we've I have a lettuce wrap, like a tempeh lettuce wrap recipe in the new book that I that I really love. So uh tempeh, miso, uh sauerkraut. So let's talk about kombucha. Can we talk about that? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So I think that kombucha is a nuanced topic. And the problem is when it's a nuanced topic, it people tend to um just kind of pick one of the spots and just you know, fire off a big, powerful shot and not necessarily like explain the complexity of it. So in, in this uh, Stanford study, people were drinking kombucha that counts as part of accomplishing your goals from a fermentation perspective. Now, kombucha is uh, very acidic. And if you're brewing it at home, there is alcohol and there's the potential that like that could get out of control and get away from you and, and become an unhealthy beverage if you're doing it at home. There is no evidence, unless you are being ridiculous in your in your kombucha consumption, that buying a bottle of kombucha at the store is going to cause harm to most people. And um, I, I think my point is this, kombucha can be part of a healthful diet. It's not required. You don't need kombucha. It would certainly not be my number one fermented food. If you consume it, I recommend consuming it in moderation. That to me is about four ounces of kombucha per day, which if you go and buy like a normal bottle of kombucha, usually it's 16 ounces. So I'm saying that one bottle could last you four days. And then what you do is, this is what I always do, is um, I will take my kombucha and they'll have four ounces, probably like right here. And for the listeners at home, I'm holding up a uh, mason jar filled with uh, water but you have your four ounces of kombucha and then I will either double or triple the volume with water and really dilute it out. Yeah. I'll dilute it out because the thing about kombucha is that it's so acidic at baseline that you can cut, you can cut the kombucha in half or by, you know, uh, a third and it still is going to taste good. It's still going to have the tartness and the acidity that you're looking for. There's still some carbonation that's there, which is I think frankly what a lot of us are searching for. Yeah. And, 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 and not, and not have to uh, drink uh, something that's so acidic and potentially harsh on the teeth. Right. I, I do find kombucha is a hot commodity these days. It's something people like it. It looks, it looks good. It feels good to carry. It's very, um, 
you know, yoga ish and, and things like that. But why I don't love it and why it wouldn't be my primary choice is because the sugar content in some of them to make these cool flavors, flavors or to really make it taste very good yeah. doesn't outweigh the the fermentation benefits that I'm getting. So that's why I'd go to the miso or I'd go to the to the sauerkraut. And, you know, if you're saying you only need four ounces, well, then <laughs> the four of us can share one. We don't all need you know, our, our own bottle. kombucha. And if we drink from the same bottle, then we'll be sharing our microbiome <laughs> and we'll all be happier and healthier. Is the fourth one your dog? Who's the fourth person? <laughs> no, we've dog? got two kids. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it, got it. Okay, I thought it was part of this party here. So. Oh, sorry. So, uh, our, our kids <laughs> I guess I like, wasn't invited. Thanks, Shoshana. <laughs> our kids like kombucha and I'm sure we've talked about it before, but is it okay for kids to be drinking it? Um, I haven't seen any clear research on that. I mean, I, I think that it's one of these questions like because because for example you know um soda beverages like teenagers are going to drink soda mm -hmm. and those are acidic and filled with either sugar or artificial sweeteners neither of which i think are very healthful so if you if you're giving me the choice between water and kombucha i'm always going to take water right. right i mean i agree with you shoshana there's other choices but if you give me the choice between kombucha and soda i'll take the kombucha right. and right. so that's just kind of trying to properly place that somewhere in between. And, and they do think of it as a, as a treat. So that can be, you know, they're going to the mall and everybody's buying a soft drink and they buy a kombucha. They're better off. They're better off. So I have a question because all of these fermented foods clearly good for the body. We've talked about fermentation actually before. So we're going to link back to that other podcast where we get a little bit more detailed, but what's, getting me right now is I'm seeing more and more people with histamine sensitivities. And I know that yeah. fermented foods are high in histamine. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And well, why don't we start? Can you explain to people what histamine is? And if it's a good thing, then why are so many people having issues with it? I am um, super excited about this topic because I feel that this has the massive potential to change people's lives. Because if you're not, pro imagine you have a histamine intolerance that has not been diagnosed and we uncover this, then we are like literally empowering you with information that could completely change your life and improve your symptoms. So, but to um, take it from the top, histamine is a signaling molecule that's a part of our normal body. We have histamine receptors in many different parts of our body, including our brain, including our blood vessels, including our, our intestines. And when we are in balance, you know, healthy humans, histamine's in there and it's a part of it. It's not to be vilified or made to be, you know, a bad thing, but like literally everything in life, there is such a thing as too much, right? We could drink too much water. If I give a patient too much oxygen, like they need it for life, but if I give them 100% oxygen, it actually causes harm to them after a few days. And I'm pretty sure there's such a thing as too much kale, but I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's have to be someone who's like really trying to prove a point there. But mm. anyway, with histamine, when we're out of balance and we have too much histamine relative to our body's ability to handle histamine, it becomes a problem. And histamine exists in our food. And it's not that our food necessarily contains uh, histamine naturally, but instead what it is, is that the microbes produce histamine. So the reason why I'm pointing that out is that these, this is why fermentation is uh, the type of food that's most strongly associated with histamine intolerance, because again, the microbes are producing the histamine. Um, they've had outbreaks of uh, histamine related food poisoning. They call it scombroid poisoning, which is kind of a cool name, scombroid related to fish consumption. And so people will eat fish and then they'll get like flushed and have diarrhea and lightheadedness and go to the hospital. And it's not actually a virus or a bacteria. It's the histamine content of the fish. Now, if you took that exact same fish and the person in theory ate it the day that the fish was caught, they wouldn't have this issue. Mm. It's, the, it's the system where the fish is caught and you know whatever, they, they clean the fish and then time passes. And during the time that passes, the microbes create histamine. So in the plant space, we uh, find that the highest histamine foods are really four specific plants. So spinach, eggplant, tomatoes, and then 
I just really hate that I have to even say it because I love them, but avocados. Hmm. All right, those are the four. And if a person has a histamine intolerance, which by the way, typically means that they have a damaged gut, and they eat these foods, like they have fermented food or they eat an avocado, you know, whatever. There's many different symptoms that they could experience. But what I want everyone to hear is the number one symptom is gas and bloating. The vast majority of people that have histamine intolerance experience gas and bloating after a meal. And then they have other symptoms as well. Could be a migraine, a headache, sinus congestion, runny nose, um, sore throat. Could be that you feel like your heart rate picked up or you're feeling lightheaded or you have skin changes. Like it could be hives or flushing um, or a rash. And then of course it could be digestive symptoms as well. So what's interesting about histamine intolerance is here's the complicated part. And then I'm going to give you the, let's simplify it part. The complicated part is there is no blood test. So it's hard for doctors to know who has histamine intolerance. And because no doctor is handing recipes to their patient, there's no way for the patient to know whether they have histamine intolerance because the way that you would test is by going on a low histamine diet. I'm going to interrupt for a second. What about those send away spit tests or stool tests or what am I allergic to tests? Will those, are those accurate? And would that show it? What am I allergic to? Is this what we're talking about? Like having this histamine, is that, that's an allergy we're talking about? So they're allergic to these foods? No, it's not actually an allergy because an allergy involves activation of the immune system against the food. So that's different. That's different than a food allergy. This is a food intolerance, which means that the immune system is not a part of it. But that when you eat the food, you get symptoms that you are undesirable. And so that's that that's how we define what a food intolerance is. Now they have all these other tests that people can do, you know, poop tests, blood tests, saliva tests, hair tests. And the problem is that none of them have actually been demonstrated to be accurate for the diagnosis of histamine intolerance. So you can check an enzyme level. The, there's a specific enzyme in the body called DAO, diamine oxidase. And it's possible to check a person's DAO level. But the problem is that that tells you nothing about how much histamine they have in their diet. And the DAO level can vary from day to day. So if we check it today, it might be one thing, but then you get a bad night's rest and you drink some alcohol tonight and then tomorrow it's different. And you see what I mean? So anyway, so the, the, the only way to really reliably know whether or not a person has this is you have to reduce the histamine in their diet. And then if they feel better, if they notice, oh my gosh, like my bloating and my runny nose went away, then you basically have demonstrated that this is what they have. They have histamine intolerance. So this is all like, you know, nuanced and complicated, but let me make it very simple because this is what the listener at home cares about is like, okay, so what do I do, Dr. B? If you have these symptoms, again, if you have bloating and any of these other symptoms, skin changes, runny nose, headache, other digestive symptoms then it's worth asking the question, do I have histamine intolerance? And the way that you answer it is by eating a low histamine diet for two weeks. And that's what my new book has. So from my perspective, what I'm doing is filling a void within our system because no doctor, I, I mean, I've always wanted to be able to hand recipes to my patients. Hey, like try this for two weeks, see if it helps you. And I haven't been able to do that until now. This is like me effectively reaching out and saying, try, try eating this way for two weeks. There's 26 low histamine recipes. You mix and match. You just eat whatever ones look good to you. But you do that for two weeks. And if you feel better, yo, we're on to something. It's and then it's a matter enough? of how do we... Two weeks is long enough to see how you feel. Okay. It's not designed to um, fix the issue in two weeks. It's enough to make you get the diagnosis. But the diagnosis is empowerment. Because the more you know, the more that you understand the root of the problem, the more that you create targeted approaches to fix it. And you're not stuck is the key. That, that's the last thing I want to say is if you're not stuck, you don't have to just eliminate these foods. We can actually heal it. And that's part of what the book is about too, is like showing people how to heal this issue so that they can actually bring these foods back onto the menu over the course of time. And so does that mean removing those four main foods that you talked about, the spinach, the tomatoes, the eggplant, the avocado, or it's much more complex than that? It's more complex than that. But like the, in the book, I give the tables because, because like, so we mentioned that fermented foods are problematic, right? There's many different foods that are actually fermented that we don't even realize like vinegar or chocolate. And of course, alcohol, 
And so, hold on so a second. I could just is, eat chocolate. I could just eat chocolate every day, and I'm getting my fermented food. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, this I think that you're worrying me into a, a trick variety here. No. <laughs> of different fibers. <laughs> yeah, I do think that actually the the right kind of chocolate uh, on that topic. I do think the right kind of chocolate actually is good for the gut microbiome because people forget that chocolate actually does come from plants, and um, it contains polyphenols. And our gut bugs do love the polyphenols, but of course, um, chocolate at the store could contain quite a bit of sugar. So we have to be careful about that. Right. And the other thing is that this should not be, uh, something that is like people go crazy with because chocolate also or chocolate. Kombucha. Sorry to interrupt. Chocolate or kombucha. The other? Yeah. Oh that's man. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's a tough one. Alternate. Uh, data. I'm going, if you're telling me this is like a 70% or more chocolate, I'm probably going with the chocolate. Nice. But that's close. Yeah. All right. Nice. Sorry, cut you off. So, so avoiding the histamine and doing this low histamine or no histamine, can you do no histamine? Does, does no every plant food histamine. have a little bit of histamine no matter what? Not just plant foods. The animal products have a ton. I mean, I know that right. the audience I'm sure is, is mostly plant-based, but right. you know, again, like the number one source of histamine is fish outside of fermentation. So, mm. Right. So, so avoiding the histamine can give you an indication of if histamine is the cause of these symptoms that you're having now, but then you go in the book and you look deeper and then you have to get to the root cause of why is your body not tolerating the histamine? And it's not enough to just avoid histamine. Then we've got to say, okay, how do we heal on that next level? 100%. And part of this is that there's this balance between the histamine in our diet, our ability to break down that histamine and our gut barrier. So imagine this, picture this, like you are the uh, either the queen or the king and you are in the citadel, all right, of this castle. The castle's got walls that surround it and you got an army outside the wall that's defending you. All right. And the invading army is the histamine. Now, the army that's protecting you is this enzyme that we've been talking about, diamine oxidase, DAO, because the DAO can neutralize this invading histamine. So if you got enough soldiers out there on the field, you can protect yourself. Right. But what if your soldiers are getting overrun? Well, we have an extra layer of defense, and that is the wall of the castle. So the wall that surrounds this castle basically is something that blocks this invading army from getting access to you, from getting to you. So when we consume histamine, it's not just the histamine that, that, we, that we consume, but it's also controlling the DAO level because the more DAO that we have, the more that we can protect ourselves from this histamine. And it's also repairing, repairing the gut barrier, which is the castle, the wall. If you repair the gut barrier, which is part of what we do, we talk about, if you repair the gut barrier, then you actually are helping to build up your protection against this happening. So now the DAO, how do we do that? Well, um, there are DAO supplements and they are not plant-based <laughs> um, and they're very expensive. They're derived from the kidneys of pigs. Mm. All right. So you can spend a bazillion dollars to go get these kid, uh, pig kidney uh, supplements, or alternatively, you can spend cents and get some um, sprouting peas and sprout them. And what's fascinating is that when you sprout legumes, the legumes actually produce DAO. This is one of the medicinal properties of sprouts is that you can sprout them and they will start to produce this enzyme that you can add to your diet. And it's like taking a supplement. Eating sprouted peas is like taking is like is actually, believe it or not, much better. And I don't mean in terms of your health. I mean in terms of the DAO levels. Eating sprouted peas has more DAO than than eating the pig kidney. And here's the last part that's cool: the the peas will produce more DAO if you sprout them in the dark because they're stressed. They're stressed, mm -hmm. and stress stress we associate with badness. But actually, like stress is better to describe it as a challenge. And challenges in our life can be good for us and make us stronger. And in this case, 
the stress of um, sprouting the peas in the dark actually makes them better at producing this enzyme. So last time we talked about broccoli sprouts as being your like superfood, if I remember correctly, <laughs> are they different than the sprouted peas? Yes, because with the broccoli sprouts, what you're doing is you're taking the broccoli seed and the broccoli seed, because it's not a legume, is not going to give you the DAO that we're talking about. Got it. Peas are not the only legume that will produce DAO. You could sprout lentils and they'll produce DAO. You could sprout any legume and they'll produce DAO. But when they did, they actually did a research study looking at different legumes and their DAO production. And the the victor, the winner, was the sprouted peas, particularly, particularly if they were sprouted in the dark. Hmm. So do you think there's a difference between, let's say you weren't going for the dark or were, if you sprout them at home on your own, I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be less expensive, but let's say you don't have the means or the times or whatever to do that. If you buy them in the store, is there like a window of when it's sprouted and when you should eat them? And then maybe it loses that as, as it's sitting on the shelf in the store and are you better off doing it at home? It's a great question. And you're testing my ability to remember the research study that we're referring to because <laughs> they did look at like what happens over the course of time in terms of the DAO levels. And it appeared that the DA levels ramped up um, for about five to seven days. I don't know if they disappeared afterwards. So I still think that the sprouted peas that you buy at the store, you know, ultimately the test is not what does a laboratory tell us? The test is when you consume this food, how do you feel? Mm. Right. All right. And that's that's what really what what matters. And so if you were to buy sprouted peas, it's worth a try. Right. And you buy these sprouted peas and you and you take them with a meal. You just eat them as an accessory to the meal with everything else. And if you notice that your histamine intolerance symptoms improve, well, we win. Can you overdo it? Can you eat too many sprouted peas? Uh, I don't think that eating it within reason, you would overdo it. I think you would have to be like very, very, very aggressive with the sprouted peas. Got it. Hmm. Amazing. I mean, we can keep going all day, right? We, it's we, like, can. we do this every time. We <laughs> can just keep talking to you and learning from you. And it's a, a new lesson every time. But you've mentioned your book a couple of times and we haven't really told our audience the title of the book or anything really about it other than you're helping them get healthier through this fiber fueled kind of lifestyle. So why don't you share what the book is called, where people can get it and a little bit about it. So the book is called the fiber fueled cookbook. And um, I guess, let me just kind of share the story of where this came from. So fiber fueled came out in May of 2020. You guys know, cause you've been on this journey with me. This has been a passion project for me. You know, this is not me doing something. I didn't, I didn't plan to be an author. I really did not. I felt compelled to do things. And with each step, doors were opening in front of me. And I go, oh, I can write a book. Okay, cool. Like, let me try that. And so, but to me, what Fiber Fueled was, was me trying to like kind of wake everyone up to the fact that 19 out of 20 people in the United States are inadequate in their consumption of fiber. And this is perhaps our most important nutrient because it's fuel for a healthy gut microbiome. And this new emerging science that we've been talking about here today is showing us how critical a healthy microbiome is if you want to be a healthy human. So I was really trying to make that connection of what you eat matters and it affects your microbiome and your microbiome affects you and your health and let it be fiber. Let's transition towards eating more plants. Let's take that. Like the book was really meant for who I was 10 years ago, where I was 5% plant-based. And I want to take that person and inspire them in the same way that I needed to hear it back then 10 years ago. So that's what fiber field was. Now, fast forward to the time after fiber field has come out. And there's like so much attention that came my way. And it's beautiful. I'm very grateful for all the attention and all the people who are inspired by my book. But there were many people who would reach out to me through the internet, or I would see them as a patient. And they would say to me, Dr. B, I love your book. I want to eat that way. But my body doesn't want me to eat that way. I am uncomfortable when I eat the food that you're describing. I don't feel well. And I think in the plant-based movement, we got to keep it real. Because transitioning to a plant-based diet is actually more challenging than transitioning to a meat-based diet. And 
So it's just way better for your health, right? It's just so much better for your health. It's obviously better for the animals and better for the planet too. I mean, it just is completely aligned and you don't have to make compromises, but you do have to go through a process to make it possible because you are asking your gut to step up and support you on this journey and in this mission. And so the Fiber Fields Cookbook came from that place of wanting to help these people who are telling me that eating a plant-based diet, they don't think it's possible for their body. And I wanted to create a resource for them. So I see this as like, it's a, it's a cookbook. Every single recipe with the exception, the biome broth is back, except now there's seven versions of it. The Snickers bites are back, except now there's four versions of them, right? Those were so popular. We had to bring them back and then blow them up and make them ridiculous. But there's 125 recipes. It's full color photography. Um, and I think that like no, no matter what kind of person you are, you're going to love the food in this book. But it also is intended to be a personal journey, almost like a recipe-based choose-your-own-adventure where like, I want to meet you where you are. You are not required to be vegan or 100% plant-based to, to enjoy this book. Let me meet you where you are and let me show you a path that can work for you in your own unique way, in a way that you feel comfortable and in a way that ultimately it brings you great joy. And the expectation is that we all follow our own personal path where this book gives you the tools that you need to be successful. And then all of a sudden you realize that one day we emerge from the woods and we're all in the same place having a plant party together because we have discovered what true gut health is and we have found great joy in our food. And that's what brings us together and allows us to feel, you know, connected and, and aligned. Well, I think that that's a really great progression and it's what people need, right? It, it's what people need. They need the step by step. They need the how to, and they need to feel like their hand is being held so that they can then take control themselves and, and do it themselves. And I noticed in the book, there's a chapter called the fiber paradox. And I'd be really upset with myself if I let you go, because I kind of chuckled when I saw it. If I let you go, if you didn't explain what the fiber paradox was. Well, paradoxes are entertaining, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know that paradoxes can be quite entertaining and um, uh, good for book sales, apparently, for some people. <laughs> yeah. So, but nonetheless, the fiber paradox is just keeping it real. Which, which is that it's acknowledging that for people who have a damaged gut, adding more fiber to their diet can be challenging. And it's because your gut is not in a good place and we actually need a healthy gut to break down and process our fiber. But the paradox of it is not that, it's that these are the people who need the fiber the most. Fiber is the most powerful way to heal and enhance the health of your gut microbiome. When you reduce your fiber, you are in no way moving yourself towards a more healthy gut microbiome. And so what I want is for people to, rather than fearing their food and feeling like they have to run away from it, I instead want to give people a method where slowly, incrementally, over the course of time, with as few uh, symptoms as possible, they are able to bring these foods back into their life and take what they think is their enemy and turn it into their friend. And when that happens, now the food you are no longer fearing, now it gets back to its rightful place, which is that it's bringing you great joy. And guess what? When you've accomplished that, not only are you enjoying that food again, you also have clearly healed your gut because you are no longer restricted. The Fiber Field Cookbook comes out today, like the day that this episode is being launched. It's, it's May 17th, right? And so where can people go to grab that? You can go wherever books are sold. So in Canada, um, of course, Indigo and Amazon. And in the US, you can do you can do Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Let me just say this, that we're coming out of a pandemic. And I hope that the local bookstore that you have in your community has survived. I can't imagine what it's been like for them. And, um, but, you know, I would personally, if I'm given the choice, I would rather see those dollars and cents go into the hands of your neighbor and support them in their small little shop relative to going through, you know, coursing through the streams of the internet to some random person who's already rich. Right. So of course we'll, we'll put the links to your book in our show notes at planttrainers.com, but we do encourage our listeners to go to their local bookstores to pick it up because it will 
hopefully be there for you, Dr. B. It's always a pleasure to have you on the Plant Trainers Podcast. We appreciate learning from you every single time. This was number three, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And before I go, I just want to add a moment of gratitude. I I was going to ask, did I ever (laughs) ask you for your moment of gratitude? (laughs) <laughs> he didn't, but, but he, 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 us a, he, he, he did gave, give us he gave some it, gratitude. but I didn't actually ask. And it's the first yeah. time, I mean, I guess, cause you're just so seasoned here. It's the first time that I hadn't actually asked in that first sentence. So please give your moment of gratitude. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to add an extra moment of gratitude. So, uh, cause I think I mentioned that I'm grateful to be here with you guys today, which I am, but I also want to add that I'm very grateful for my wife. Um, we're expecting baby Bolsowitz number three. Yeah, and carrying uh, baby Bolsawai, Bolsawitzes, uh, mm-hmm. and it's not so easy because I am a very big Polish guy, <laughs> and <laughs> so like this child at 36 weeks was already over seven pounds, and um, yeah, I mean the baby's huge. So anyway, I just wanted to. I hope that my wife listens to this episode, and I want her to know that I'm grateful for her and her carrying this baby because it's like. I'm like, you know, casually walking around and doing my same normal stuff. And she's having to live this every hour of every day. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative. Well, we're very excited for you. And we are sitting on the edge of our seats waiting to hear all the great news. So we look forward to that. And thank you so much. We look forward to the next time you're on. Thank you so much, Plan Trainers. Great to, it's always great to see you guys. Love y'all. Thank you all so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. We want to make sure that you subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or any other podcasting platform. We really appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it really helps other people find us just like you did. Thanks so much to our patrons. To become a patron, visit us at patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference in the quality of the show and don't forget to connect with us on instagram and twitter our handle is at plant trainers like plant trainers on facebook join our newsletter and check out our website at planttrainers.com for awesome recipes a list of our services and of course our latest podcast we encourage you to email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so that we can help you improve your quality of life through nutrition and fitness so we hope we've inspired you today join us again next time and and have have a a healthy day. day Or is that too corny? It's a little cheesy.